This is the third video in this little series about why you shouldn't fear the end of the state, the breakdown of the state. And here I want to focus um, on the policy of mass immigration and how and the impoverishing effects it has. The, the economic effects are only one way. They make the poor poorer and the rich richer. They make the, the grits cost more and the grunts cost less. As I explained in the last video, mass immigration a constant inflow of migrants they don't compete with the bulk of employees with everyone who's in work they compete with the small minority the tiny percentage who are actively looking for a new job that's where wages are set and all of those those, those migrants to the extent that they are economically active at all that is, they will compete with that small section of the workforce. So they'll have a disproportionately large effect in reducing wages, in grinding people down. And that's why mass immigration appears to be a pillar of state policy, uh, which, and, and that in turn explains why mass immigration rises with every politician's promise to reduce it. And, the harm it, and, and it explains also why mass immigration is running at full blast. The system w would probably struggle to accommodate uh, more immigration than it currently is. I think politicians will try, but simply being able to bring people in, house them and process them uh, couldn't run any faster. Uh, uh, the, the, the harm that mass immigration does, it, it isn't some unfortunate byproduct of um, uh, a benevolent policy. The harm that it does is the policy. That is the desired political end. And one of those harms is wealth transfer from poor to rich, particularly to big businesses, businesses that sell goods and items into the economy. And it's, uh, that they get more, um, more and cheaper labour and they get more customers, more demand for their goods which are made cheaper. And, it, uh, the, and the businesses that really make out like, like a bandit are the businesses or, or, or are the, the um, or the people who make out like a bandit are the people who own uh, uh, limited or, uh, or monopoly assets. So uh, land holdings around the edges of towns, big banks or uh, big uh, utility type corporations such as communications and phone companies. And they, they do really well because the population expands and increases and suddenly um, assets that might not have been worth very much suddenly are brought into the market and become worth a lot of money. Uh, and what it means is that uh, the strong arms necessary to build a house, they get cheaper. But the queue of people lining up to pay money to live in that house gets longer. The people who are already rich get richer. And the, the neighbourhood effects of mass immigration, uh, or, or that, those economic effects, are as nothing compared to the neighbourhood effects. The neighbourhood effects are disastrous. Take... Um, well, if you doubt that, go and look around your own neighbourhood if there's been any form of mass immigration into it. Take a look at the East End of London. That was uh, a very resilient uh, uh, community. That, that genuinely was a community that had been forged through centuries of hardship. It was kind of a, uh, an indigenous uh, social ecosystem destroyed at a stroke, destroyed as by a wildfire as a result of mass immigration. Gone for good, it's not coming back. Now, that sense of neighbourhood and community, that probably doesn't matter very much to the rich because the rich can hop from town to town, country to country. But a sense of neighbourhood matters more if you're poor enough to need your neighbours. The less you have, the more you value things like neighbourhood and national identity. It's not just a question of bigotry, chauvinism and pride. Although, although people's identity really, really matters to you, that matters to you if you're poor because it's a matter of dignity. You can say, I don't have much, but at least but I am English. You need to respect me. That's what poor people's patriotism is saying. And rightly so, they've got every right to say that. And, but you, in addition, your identity becomes very valuable because it, it binds people together. It binds people to shared values. It's a way of saying, I share these values, this, this and that way of operating. And then when people have shared values, shared ways of behavior, it means that people can rely on each other. People can depend on each other. So they know they might have, have neighbors to depend on if, if, um, if things go wrong it, you know, on a rainy day. And, and this, is why, this is why the poor um, appear so defiantly patriotic, why patriotism matters to them, and why the rich are so snobbish about it, why the rich find 
poor people's patriotism so ugly because it's form a form of defiant resilience and interdependence that the rich just don't need so it just seems unnecessary to, to wealthy people mass immigration kills that pretty much stone dead and the evidence is uh, um, the evidence is abundant the evidence is that a little diversity goes a long long way uh, um, you can look at the research of uh, a professor Robert Putnam in America he looked at, I think at 40 different cases and 30,000 people and what he found was again it wasn't what he wanted to find what he found was that uh, um, diversity makes everyone less trusting less socially engaged less um, community minded this idea that because an area is more diverse it, it becomes a community no the opposite is the case it becomes a non community and also it not only creates suspicion between different ethnic groups it creates suspicion and detachment within different ethnic groups uh, and and, and a right across right across the spectrum it doesn't matter what sex you are what age what socioeconomic status um what your race is you hunker down you do not get involved again it's easy to see how this is in the interest of politicians why that makes mass immigration a pillar of state state policy because it means that people cease to rely on one another they cease to be able to rely rely on one another so they then become reliant on the state and uh, people who are more reliant on the state are more dependent and easier to rule more manageable and if you are someone who's addicted to power, you like that. Your power increases because the person you have power over becomes more powerless. Now, I, I notice people starting to cotton on to this idea of, um, of this, uh, of, there, of, of there being something genocidal about this drive to dissolve and replace the sense of ourselves as a people. And I've dealt with this loads of, uh, loads of times, so I don't go over it again here, except to say, just read Article 2 of the 1948 UN Genocide Convention. The case is clear and simple. It's, I, I think it's undeniable. But uh, for the politician's re responsibility, look at Article 3, where it sets out um, what acts might, might, class, might be classed as complicity in genocide, well, including complicity in genocide. I don't know how a politician is going to answer that, that charge. What I'm guessing is that, is that they're going to say, well, you babes in the woods, you idiots, you, you, you voted for me, so you can just suck it up. I don't think that's going to work. Firstly, because genocide, a charge of genocide, tends to unravel a lot of legal defences. In the law, in international law and the law of states, uh, genocide will, it can justify humanitarian intervention or just outright invasion. So I don't think the, the, the defence of you were an idiot to vote for me in the first place is going to work in the face of such a, such a charge. Uh, s secondly, um, it's very difficult for a politician to argue, to argue that there was a state of competition and people were choosing amongst a range of options. Competition isn't competition when you only have one shoulder to look over in a two-party state. And when, when every party, all the parties, have been colluding and cooperating very hard, very unscrupulously, very ruthlessly, in order to suppress any opposition to this idea of um, PC multiculturalism, then it makes it makes it even even harder for a politician to to, to um, come up with that trumped up defence. I think politicians are going to find it very difficult. They're going to be sweating hard when they see a lot of people eyeballing them when the delights of diversity come to a head. And the delights of diversity will come to a head with the end of the state, largely for the reasons that that I've I've laid out above. If if diversity hinders people from cooperating together and working together for their own survival in order to make life livable and if a, a, a cooperation is necessary in order to be able to survive then uh, if that becomes necessary then people will drop diversity like a used condom diversity then it, then what happens it, it ceases to be the source of hag ridden degradation that it currently is and it becomes a block to survival and people just will not put up with it you, people don't put up with things that threaten their survival in general so if you want people to collectivize you just wait you just wait for the state to go down make make no mistake about it if the state goes down people will collectivize good and hard along national lines 
and national lines means birth lines. That's the source of the word birth, and that means ethnic and racial lines. People, um, uh, people will collectivize with other people who speak, think, act, and look like them. And the question then won't be who is a multiculturalist. The question will be who was a multiculturalist, because quite a lot of the multiculturalists are the ones who are in power. I would expect a few of them to start jumping on the last plane out. Now. I don't think the death of the state is something to agitate for. It's not a good idea to jump up and start trying to tear down the state. Don't do that. But it's not something, well, and I also recognize that if, if the state goes down, that things will temporarily, for a while, things will go out of joint like a boxer's nose. That is not nice. But in the long term, this is not something to fear, the breakdown of the state. It's not the end of civilization. It's just the end of a mode of civilization that has gone bad and can't, can't be saved.